Good afternoon and welcome to Captured by Women. My name is Matilda Abahames, a communications expert. And I am Elizabeth Olympio Emmanuel, a restaurateur and a project management consultant. Captured by Women is a program that looks at critical issues from the perspective of women. Let's have a look at what we discussed last week. The investigation or the video we all watched, we didn't see much of the board being an issue in it. However, like people are extending the argument that, hey, the man serves on the board and he is the CEO, so what was the board doing? We need to also wait for the investigation to end. However, from our side, for a procurement to end, it's not only the supplier or the, the, the purchaser or the contractor. The one who is even also awarding the contract, where this supposed business, this supposed company, where were they getting the contract from? The procurement staff, the other people in those organizations, what, what did they see to award this contract? This program is sponsored by Udin, Udin Le Create, as well as Emerald Suites and Raid. Raid says protect your family from mosquitoes day and night. This week, pressure mounts on government to explain reasons given by the MD for Bost for his resignation. Please lives matter. There has been a rampant attack on the lives of police officers. We've heard the stories of two officers that were shot dead in Gomwa. We will be talking about this. Former President John Mahama has blasted government for abandoning A blocks, which were supposed to augment the educational sector. We shall discuss it as well. Up next, Spin. So Eliza, former President John Mahama has blasted government for abandoning the e-blocks that were meant to augment the education sector's um, drive to decongest the classrooms. Um, I find this very fascinating, uh, not his blasting, but it, it, it seems it's um, a culture. It is. That a lot yeah. of governments take over and then abandon what they came to meet rather than finishing up. And that's obviously because of the manifestos, the various party manifestos. They need to roll out what they promise so that they get re-elected. So obviously when uh, a new government comes into power and um, their projects, they have to roll out their new projects. They, they most often do not continue. This is something, a trend we have observed. I think the only government that didn't do that was uh, Professor, the late Professor John Evans at our mills. He continued uh, projects from the previous government and got it to completion. But we'll see that a lot of the projects from affordable housing, the e-blocks that is now the, the crux of the matter, hospitals, we still have hospitals that are growing weeds. And this is something that um, governments need to put a stop to because the, uh, the funding for this, if it's borrowed, it's still going to be paid for. If you're going to investigate the corruption or whatever that uh, took place to, before that uh, contract was uh, given, disbursed, cash disbursed, uh, the project still needs to be completed regardless. We can complete them and make good use of it. But yes, I think there, there is cause for a bit of the lambasting because it's taxpayers' money. It is our money. It is the country that stands out to lose, if hospitals have been built, is there a problem why it's not operationalized? Why are these e-blocks not being operationalized? Is it because it's in a location that cannot be used? Were they uh, located in areas that, what are the issues? Bring them out so that the public, we the citizenry know as well. Then we can argue the points out from an informed uh, position. But when we see developments, it's not cheap to put up infrastructure. So if it's been put up to a certain level, I think it, the, the justifiable move is to complete them. 
you know and then the, the, the other bit is even if we were, they were located in places that were not reachable so to say we could always find a way to utilize those yes, facilities yes yes and so there's no point in abandoning the projects if we have suspicions of the contracts that were awarded or, let's Deal investigate with it. them yeah, special but meanwhile let's put there. those facilities <laughs> to good use you yes. know because we need them we need the housing projects we need the educational facilities all infrastructure so, is all, good everything is good you know some time ago i traveled into um a front plains okay and that, that was 12 years ago hmm. and i got in there and some hospitals, they were actually community clinics that were established, and they were built there. Never been used. They had never been used, oh, and that's they had tragic. Grown. So it's not new. The unfortunate thing is that maybe John Mahama is talking about it because when he came with um, Atamels, they were able to finish those, at, yeah. at least a lot of those that were left. But it is a culture that we have, and we may have to be looking again at that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we hope um, that is done the projects need to be completed that's that's my opinion coming up next on captured by women bust and its unending problems linking it to procurement processes welcome back from the break i am elizabeth the unending stories and troubles of BOST. BOST was in the news in 2017 for causing the country to lose about seven million in revenue for allegedly selling some five million liters of contaminated fuel at a cheap price by two unlicensed companies. About two years on, the president's appointee in charge of BOST tenders his resignation to his appointer for alleged breach of contract processes. It is still unclear as to why he decided to resign. We have COPEC here to discuss what they think the problem is and also to get to know why they are calling for the dissolution of the board. With us today is Mr. Duncan Amwa, Executive Director of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC. Duncan, you're welcome to Captured by Women once again. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you. Um, it's good to be captured by women, but <laughs> at least you free us um, when you are done capturing, so as we're <laughs> able to go and do other things. Tell us a bit about BOST. And what then, does BOST stand for, and um, exactly why are they in the news right now? Okay. So you have a petroleum downstream system. Um, that deals with receiving products or companies that go to source for products and bring them in and then you need to store the products and you need to transmit or transport uh, the product to across the country. So somewhere in 93, uh, the idea of having a national strategic storage you know, facility was mooted. And uh, the nation set out to build these big farm tanks or tank farms uh, that will be able to hold products uh, as a strategic stock for you and I. So that when later there's a problem and your ports cannot receive products or the world system has a challenge and so products cannot move across uh, ports. Uh, Ghana would at least be a little sufficient, self-sufficient right. with fuel that we have stored. Mind you, the Americans are able to store fuel for up to 10 years. So how much, what volume of fuel storage do we have in backup? Um, you know, as we speak, BOST has about 978 million liters of uh, storage space. Uh, if you ask what the backup currently is, how I'm, much I'm fuel afraid is in there? Uh, that would be zero as far as strategic stock position is concerned because we are not even bringing the product. Now, what BOST has been reduced to is a dumper or a storage facility where the private BDCs who bring products uh, can do what we call the throughput arrangement. So you bring your fuel, you, you pump into BOST tanks, and then you pay something but, but to that's, BOST that's for storage. That's the for the 
BDCs. Exactly. So why is BOST now taking up that responsibility? It brings us back to the object of forming BOST and where BOST or how BOST is operating today. So we set out to do three things. A strategic storage uh, facility and then also to develop further transportation system for moving products across the country. Okay. So that comes with the, the, the T in the bus, you know, uh, bulk oil storage and transportation. And then the third one, which should have been full security for everybody, is that if bus had products that they bought uh, at, say, $20 when prices were 20 if you wake up tomorrow and war prices have surged to 60 bus you can say, look, you don't have to bother. Yeah, because don't we have import because we have what we got at 20 so we can even maintain or mitigate uh, price surge for you and so Which you could sense. have done either of the three unfortunately now it's the first one which is to hold strategic stock is not happening because boss probably doesn't even have the money to go bring fuel and store for us then they went into fuel trading uh, which is what the normal BDCs, BDCs engage in the normal BDCs would do forward trading and are profitable. Yes. But politicians would not allow boss to work. And so you have a situation where when the party is in power, the big shots would rather want to supply fuel to bust. And mind you, fuel supplies deals with numbers. So if I am going to source for product as a private BDC and I'm able to negotiate at plat minus 10, which is the benchmark minus 10 because I'm buying a certain volume. And a politician goes to bring fuel to BOST and says that mine is plat plus 10. What it means is that BOST cannot trade because your price already is too it's high for the up. market. It's marked up. And so politicians have found a way to cripple fuel trading with BOST. They cannot. You will not be allowed a free hand to just go and bring in what everybody is bringing because one big shot says I can supply the fuel to you. But then it means then the B BDCs are also being crippled. Their businesses are being crippled because you have the politicians competing, engaging, engaging in the same trade with them. Some of these BDCs have also invested in tank farms. They've built their own tank farms. You see, the BDCs would not have a competition. It's the open market. If I want to buy fuel from, let's say, British Petroleum, BP, right. or let's say, Trafigura or Vitor, right they have their benchmark values so they will look at volumes i'm picking from them or what kind of market i'm providing for them if boss comes and says oh give me plat minus six give me plat minus ten and they have a justifiable business case the player would be willing to trade so bdc will go and trade they will go and source for products as best as negotiable for them Bust being a state-run entity, however, would face challenges. Unlike the BDC getting a free hand to operate, Bust now comes under a certain state control. And so a politician goes in and says, I will supply the fuel for you, Bust. But a politician cannot go to a private BDC and say, I am going to supply you the fuel. So instead of Bust being able to go out there and buy his own fuel and possibly come to the market and trade, Politicians have hijacked that system. And that is also not viable because the private BDCs are able to run more efficiently. Okay. So that is one ang angle. Okay. So trading is out. Now you come to a situation where instead of developing infrastructure, the pipeline system, uh, the water. Um, which is the mandate know, of BOST. Which is the mandate of BOST. You don't see much in that regard. Uh, you rather have the trucks that haul p products from across the country uh, doing more of the fuel transportation. Meanwhile, bus should by now have been able to develop a more efficient pipeline system such that you can move products from Accra to say Tamale in one hour. Because when you are pumping through a pipeline, pipeline system, is much it's faster same, and yes, safer. Safer and faster. And your quantities would not also have the disparities because if it could just move, that's it. Unfortunately, that is also not being done. So you have a situation where the core or the key objects of BOST are not being vigorously pursued. So add that things would serve as a distraction, a very useful distraction. Other things that BOST originally was not expected to be engaged in is what they end up, you know, engaged in.
One of them being this uh, fuel haulage situation, mm -hmm. where instead of bus developing infrastructure to transport, uh, we are relying solely on the truck system to move products. And because that is more of an allocation system, if you get in there and you are not a strong person to say the right things be done, people say, give me the allocation, let me give it to party people, uh, let me manage this, let me do that, and all manner of things. So the wrangle, the struggle with bus is an institutional issue, it's a systemic one that needs to be dealt with. If we don't deal with that, I'm afraid we'll continue to have this discussion over and why, over and over and over. Why are we having three CEOs in three years? Um, like I indicated, if it was a straightforward agenda, right, we are holding strategic stock, right, we are trying to stabilize prices for Ghanaians, if it's a straight agenda, I'm sure everybody else will be able to deal. But once you get in there, different political interplays, Different power and influences also are looking for some business with BOST. So either you satisfy everybody or you satisfy uh, somebody somewhere, somebody else would be unhappy. And so I'm saying that if we don't solve the systemic issues, right, such that BOST would now be very focused in delivering a strategic stock for Ghanaians, would be very focused in developing transportation system for fuel, you know, movement across the country. We will continue to go around in circles such that one MD comes, uh, he doesn't get a free hand to operate because politicians across the divide have one business interest or the other that they want most to execute. So um, clearly, it's something that the state would need to sit back and address once and for all. But this is have... what we set up BOST mm. for, and this is what we want it to do. Any other businesses, uh, BOST should not be engaged in. Let us just go ahead and do what we set out to do. Other than that, the power play, the political usurpation, uh, the, the wrangling, the backbiting, the stabbing, all of them will continue to go on. Whether you have asked um, government to come clear on reasons given by the, the former MD. What have you picked? You see, two things. If you listen to why the now former MD, George Mensa Oakley, would resign, uh, one section of the story has it he was protecting a certain public purse, right? Some people wanted allocation jobs. He said no, he has to do that. And uh, in, in another breath, you are also told there was a certain grading job to be done in one of the depots that people pegged at four million, he said he could get it done at 90,000. If that were the case, the first of those issues out there, if that was the case, his resigning because it goes against his conscience would only mean one thing. The crooks or the criminals who wanted the four million, I mean, contract executed to chop the money are still in the system. Yes, they are. So when he leaves, the system is still as corrupted as probably he, when he was there. Again, if it was the other way around, where he had also engaged in apparent corruption, either he has, I mean, conflict of interest situations, or he has formed private companies and is siphoning funds from bust, allowing him to resign and going home to enjoy that booty still does not serve the nation's interest. So we have said, probe either of the two issues. If he was protecting the public purse, then it means that others were seeking to loot the public purse. Can we get to the bottom of it and get those persons unraveled and punished? If he also was not protecting the public purse and was engaged in any fraudulent, corrupt practices, let us ensure that we prosecute him as well so that he doesn't go home and chop 50 million, 100 million, 10,000 million uh, just because he's resigned and he's going home to enjoy. But whatever the case may be, be that as it were, if we don't get to the bottom of it, I am afraid a new MD will come. The same challenges might the exist. The previous MD, Mr. Alfred Boating, exactly. that's the, um, the case concerning the contaminated fuel. He was cleared of any wrongdoing, but was there contaminated fuel? Was the fuel sold? <laughs> How did that go down? Because if these 
stories keep coming, then definitely the, uh, the MDs will, will definitely be changing at that rapid rate because people will talk. You see, so we had an issue with contamination because for us, primarily, the unsuspecting Ghanaian should not wake up and go to a filling station seeking to buy fuel, which is already expensive, and then you are pumped some bad and products. It ruins your vehicle. Yes, it ruins well. your vehicle and everything. So we wanted to ensure that bad fuel does not get onto the market. Indeed, some product had gone out. When we raised the issue, uh, the first line of defense was that nothing is going out. Then MPA goes into it, 471,000 is already lodged in a private facility in Tema. So there were truths in there. Unfortunately, people had an interest to cover up, who were insulted and maligned. Eventually, when the state intelligence or security went into it, I'm sure they found some useful reason for which he had to be sacked. Then comes a, a certain George Oakley. He probably is not doing contamination. But if he is also doing anything corrupt, it behoves on us to fix that thing so that the next person doesn't even get the chance to corrupt himself or be corrupted or get the chance to also be put in a situation where there's a conflict of interest you know, at play. And so we are saying that if we do not solve the systemic issues at BUST, if we do not unravel, demystify, and bring certain persons who have become too powerful within the system, whose names may not be out there, if we don't bring them out and get the justice system to go after them, I am afraid a new MD will come. The same system that probably let George uh, either to corrupt himself or to run off the boat because he couldn't continue, I mean, allowing certain corrupt practices. Yeah. The same system would continue to be perpetuated on all of us. And once bust is down, your full security situation in Ghana is nothing useful to write home about. Once bust is down, uh, you expecting to have fuel in Tamale when you drive there will only be a mirage. Once bust is down, you expecting that there will be full price stability in Ghana would only be a mirage because they would have to hold the stock over a period of time to be able to determine when to release the stock, you know, so as to balance or even out the market uh, when prices are surging. Unfortunately, BOST seem to be heading in a different direction altogether out of the same object for which it was set up. Are we likely to see um, bulk, BOST coming back? And what do we have to do to ensure that it gets back onto its mandate? Because you've enumerated quite a number of factors for which BOST is unable to operate the way it was established to. Um, you see, BOST is viable. BOST is a good investment. And I have said this, if the private uh, tank operators, private BDCs, Chase, Cyrus, Sahara, are able to invest $20 million in tank farms, right, and are able to do business and recoup these monies, and BOS has gotten all those sunk costs, not working against it, but they should just work and be able to stay viable and be able to help the country, and BOS is having a challenge, then maybe the time might come when we need to also get some privatization done. So probably we may get to that stage where uh, we outsource BOST to a private uh, entity. Is that very wise for the security and safety of the country? You see, outsourcing means that you have your KPIs, key performance indicators. indicators yes. What are you expecting these people to do? Just like the PDS ECG issue. <laughs> if PDS came in stronger, and could reduce the transmission losses and all of that, I mean, Wouldn't we would have, have a more today. efficient system. Yeah, okay. so <laughs> you may have to get to that stage where uh, possibly right. you get people, this is what you are taxed to do, I'm going to pay you $10,000 every month, and I expect these reports, these outends, if I put in an investment of $50 million, I expect to at least recoup $60 million as a business concern, mm -hmm. instead of operating bust as a political you know, so, so alternatively, would we say the mode of appointment itself is also a source of worry for the very existence of BOST? Clearly, uh, it hasn't helped much the past two, three years. Uh, instead of getting people uh, whose influence probably would rub off the company, uh, we seem just to go around in circles. We brought in a publisher uh, 
who probably didn't have too much of an idea what even contamination meant. Should have been an industry person. And that possibly. Yeah. Okleo is, is an industry person, reading so, his background. Exactly. So he came in with a lot of hope and goodwill from all of us, with the expectation that because he had some knowledge of the industry, uh, he will be able to reposition mm. Bost. As to whether he was doing that and he was asked out, or whether the facts are yet to come okay. out, but whatever it is, we would beg authorities yeah. to help these CEOs they put in there to succeed. Because if the president appoints and a party person goes to say, let me do this job, and he says no, and that party person can go back to the president to get, I mean, the CEO in trouble, then clearly the president himself has also shot the CEO that he put there. I'm not saying that is the is case. It, is it but a it lucrative that... area? Uh, I'm the... asking <laughs> because you, you have uh, quite a number of institutions that are supposed to be taking on party uh, operatives. Is this one of those institutions that you Obviously, have party oil. of natives? <laughs> you see, anything oil is money. Oil and is money. Clearly. <laughs> no, I'm not talking oil. about lucrative, as in a lucrative venture. Is it an area where politicians think that they can use to satisfy the, or compensate the... Uh, yeah. Yes, but let me ask <laughs> this one because it is important. You see, what is because it you know, you mentioned the issue of politicians, politicians, politicians. Are they inhibiting it because it is a place where they can use for some of their to benefits? Recoup, recoup uh, yes. Indeed, <laughs> you couldn't have put it any better. It is one of the very fertile business grounds that politicians believe they can make money from. Mind you, we used to have a very buoyant refinery company, Tor. Yeah. The same political chess game. Party comes, party goes, party functionaries, allocations are made losses are done and nobody is held accountable. Account People just go there, milk the system dry. Mm. In the end, Tor makes That's losses amazing. and you know who they ask to pay? The trotro driver out there. Yeah. The journalist who didn't have any idea who was milking what. The same trajectory or challenge is facing bust. It's like an oil, I mean, giant. That if ordinarily was operating as an economically viable space, there should be a lot of money, a lot of income for BOST itself. Unfortunately, look at what befell Tor. At a time that a refinery could accommodate 350 people, it had a staff strength double the number. Today, BOST could also equally evenly operate at about 400, 450. Mm -hmm. It has about 750, 800. So if you look at just overheads, right, just off the top of you could tell that it is choking. Mm. Yeah. And it will get to a point where it becomes unsustainable because BOST is not even trading now. For it to say it is bringing fuel and selling to make margins on it. It is rather dependent on incomes that we give it as a people when we buy fuel. And then again, what the BDCs pay through their throughput uh, arrangements. If we don't stop the system, you would have another Tamoyo refinery incident on your hands we, at we BOST. We're talking about we Tamoyo oil refinery. We, there's, there's said to be a cartel. <laughs> holding on to the oil sector, preventing us from being able to implement our policies because of the money that comes with it. This cartel are political. I cannot see how a journalist, I cannot see how a normal day truck driver would Could have that, that. that power. The power resides with a certain group of people who are the political figureheads or put for or whatever. So if these people decide, if the president called everybody and said, I don't need any of you to go to bust. Whatever their operational dynamics are, allow them to function so that it is not a politician supplying fuel to bust. I'm sure bust can go out there and also buy from yeah. British Petroleum the same way the BDCs are able to buy and be able to come and sell to Ghanaians and even make profit. But as it were, the politicians will go with their briefcases, negotiate all kinds of contracts. Sometimes things that will cost the private BDC $100,000 to do, it might cost boss $10 million. Where we went into a certain report, where fuel losses, right, or um, fuel that we call slop or sledge, fuel yeah. that becomes bad as residue. Whereas the private operators were generating uh, less than 7000 in 10 years, boss could generate $5 million within one year. <laughs> Mr. Duncan Amwell, <laughs> you have given us a lot of information to chew on.
<laughs> Thanks for the clarity. Um, we hope the investigation will come out so that we could all have be on the same page with um, the information that they come out with, with the findings. Uh, we, we would lastly beg of authorities to ensure that the new person coming yeah. in is given as much free Room hand to, operate. to work as yeah. a professional instead of the political interferences that we subject these people to. If that doesn't stop, I'm afraid we'll be yeah. back here and I'll be captured by my beautiful women <laughs> and both would be in the <laughs> news for Mr. the wrong Edwin reasons. Mr. Edwin Provencal has been named as the new um, CEO. CEO of BOST. He's an outstanding personality and we hope he's given the, the, free, room, hand. the free hand to operate and uh, transact business. Thank you very much, Mr. Duncan Amwa, for joining us today. Viewers, we have been Thank talking you. to Mr. Duncan Amwa. Um, on the issues of BOST and its um, ending worries. Mr. Duncan Amwa is the CEO, the Executive Director of the Chamber of uh, Petroleum Consumers, Ghana, COPEC. We'll be right back from the break. Stay with us. Last week on Captured by Women, we discussed the spate of killing of police officers. And this week, we've had two more killed. What is causing the surge in the killing of police officers? And what strategy is amiss at this point with the police administration? We have Executive Director of Center for Human Security and Peace Building, Sunny Adip, here to discuss insecurity with the police officers. Is it worrying for us to, within a month, record six killings? Well, it is worrying and already there's a section of the population who um, are losing confidence in the police service. And I've spoken with a number of persons who keep asking the possibility of the police to provide them security if the police cannot pro protect themselves. So already there's a rusty relationship between the general population and the police. And when you have uh, police officers increasingly killed in the line of duty, it adds up to the already existing loss in confidence within the section of the population in the police administration. It is also very worrying because this, high serious, this has I mean, serious security um, implications on, on the country. Uh, it, it emboldens the criminals. It demystifies the police service as a potent force to reckon with. Because if the criminals start feeling that we can attack the police and we can inflict casualties on them. Obviously, it would give them more impetus and more motivation. But is that not to perhaps the mentality of the criminal now to put some fear in the police service? Obviously, it's a strategy and um, it's not the first time this is happening. Um, not very long ago, we had uh, some armed bandits attacking and killing a police officer in broad daylight at La Paz. And uh, we also had uh, an incident involving a, a group of uh, young men attacking a police station at Kwabinya, killing an inspector and releasing their comrades. So this obviously is an indication of how brazen, how audacious uh, these uh, criminals have become. And it's as a result of the fact that we're failing to um, identify and deal with the fundamental issues uh, the, the police service is being confronted with. What are these fundamental issues? Well, if you really want to know the fundamental issues, I think the wrong persons to get the information from uh, the top-ranked police officers. Because of that, when I close from work, sometimes I pass by police stations, get to engage the junior officers, and that is where you get the true state of affairs within the police service. And trust me, one of the biggest issues has got to do with um, providing the necessary logistics for the police to work. You don't expect a farmer to go and farm without a hoe or a cutlass. And I may ask, is it normal for a patrol team to be unarmed in a hot chase? It is not normal. It's it, not normal. It doesn't make sense. And so in the training of our police officers, they are paired up and that is fine. They are not alone. They are not, they are not trained to be in patrol teams alone, at least two people. Now, when you start a hot chase, do you call for backup? What is the level of training? What strategies are put in place 
because these incidents are becoming are showing up the flaws in the operational strategies of the police you are very right um, we do have some lapses in the training regime okay but what is particularly worrying is the fact that um, insecurity is changing by the day. Yesterday's insecurity is not as today. Because of new issues, new strategies, new weapons, new actors. You can cite and three lapses in yesterday's event in, the, yeah. in this um, recent shooting of the two officers, which is no backup, no ammunition, no protection. They did not communicate. The, the problem is the police lack the logistics. We okay. expect them to deliver, yet we don't give them the logistics. And it doesn't make sense because under normal circumstance, um, all officers on duty are supposed to be, one, uh, 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 given side arms, and secondly, should have some level of protection in the form of bulletproof vests. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we constrict it all to officers on special operations. No, no, no. But it is wrong, it is wrong, and I've always called on the government and the police administration to show commitment towards providing the police officers with these logistics because in the end these are young men and women who are in our neighborhoods in street corners yes. putting their lives on the line to ensure you and i are safe unfortunately the training and the provision of logistics is constricted to the top who already have bodyguards, they have drivers, they have vehicles, and they, are seated, well in their, and they are seated in their air-conditioned offices. Yet, we have these officers in their thousands in the streets without so, protection. So recently, we had about 250 body cams imported in for the uh, police administration out of 3,000. Would this help, for instance, for the person who is going on patrols, or is it just supposed to be for special operations? <laughs> um, it's, 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 um, it's a knee-jerk approach. I mean, it's, it's a joke for crying out loud. We have about 32,000 police officers and for you to um, import 250 body cams, I don't think it's going to change much. And uh, the body cams, uh, the body, body cams, sorry, are particularly meant to aid in investigation, especially when it involves the police officer doing what he's not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. All right? Rather, our focus should be, one, on giving all police officers on duty some level of protection by giving them the side arms. And also we can add some technological touch to crime and investigation. When you go to other jurisdictions, they have dashboard cameras, yeah. okay? They are able, like you rightly mentioned, call for backup yes. through an efficient and effective communication, communication network. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the case. And police officers are taught how to approach motorists, okay, how to approach suspects and all that. Obviously, when I'm driving and I'm stopped by the police, the way the police approaches me should be different from a non-compliant driver because it is highly likely he's uh, uh, engaged in a criminal activity and he's fleeing the crime scene or he's up to no good. So you don't expect a police officer to step out of his vehicle, hello, my brother, why are you spitting? No. Under normal circumstances, what they do is, from the comfort of your vehicle, you, 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 you seek protection from the door of the police vehicle. Then you order the driver to, to show down. his hands first, step out of the vehicle, make sure his back is towards the police, and walk backwards towards the police. Then they can be sure. Unfortunately, the, the protocols are not taught. We don't have in-service training. Their skills are not sharpened. And this is why we have increasing police casualties. Yes. Okay. I so, agree entirely with you. So you, you have obsolete training methods. What about what we started with the community policing? Unfortunately, um, when uh, IGP Alassan left, it, it became, I don't know, dysfunctional. Um, I was speaking with one of my diplomatic friends who said, I don't want to mention, but he said they um, um, donated some bicycles, yeah. like in their thousands, to aid in the community, community policing process. Unfortunately, at the point when they went back for monitoring, 
almost all the bicycles were not working. I'm sure a lot of police officers prefer driving in tundras and you know V8s yeah. rather than bicycles. Bicycle. And and most of them had broken and nobody is paying attention to it. But it's particularly important because when you take a closer look at the uh, formation of uh, the Metropolitan Police in Britain by Sir Robert Peel, he came out with. Later, he became the British Prime Minister. He came out with something we call the Nine Pillion Principles of Modern Day Policing, which serves as a benchmark for best policing practices all across the world. And it's hinged around the fact that for a police service to be efficient, they need the public to be part of that process. And how can the public be part of that process? By engaging the public through perhaps uh, fora, by making the public part of the policing process. Because currently, we have a police population of about 32,000. The police civilian ratio, one officer to about 900 citizens. In urban areas like Kasu Accra, it's even more staggering. But according to the UN standard, standards, it's supposed to be one police officer to 500 citizens. That means we cannot have the police everywhere all the time. Hence, the need for the people to be part of that process. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And I've always contended that without the people taking part in that process, there's no way absolutely no way the police can do their work. The civilian police contact is mostly in traffic. But do we have police officers knocking on doors and asking people, are you okay? Do you feel safe? What are your menacing security challenges? No. no. Do we have police on officers knocking at on businesses, asking them what their challenges are? No. We still have a lot, a lot of Ghanaians who, when stepping out of the house, would leave the keys under the doormat or on top of the door in the flower pot or under the flower pot. This is something the criminals are very accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Do we have a police communication protocol that would engage the people more so they all become part of the security maintenance process? Obviously not. How do we improve on our own security as a people rather than um, perhaps looking forward to the please because you will need to improve on yourself before you look forward to exactly a lot of Ghanaians are not conscious I mean when you are driving are we conscious of our environment whether we are being followed or not and if you think you are being followed I think there are some protocols to follow what you do is to drive to the nearest roundabout just to be sure the person is following you go around about two three times if you confirm then you have to drive to the nearest police station if there's no police station, you drive to the nearest public space and seek help. And particularly goes to you guys in the media. Um, there are definitely topics that come up that wouldn't go down well with some people, you know. So some people might hold grudges against you. That is why it's important to always be aware. In our neighborhoods, okay, in our communities, you need to be alert. You need to be vigilant. When you see strange people moving in, driving strange unregistered vehicles, behaving mm -hmm. strangely, moving logistics strangely, not working during the day but only at night. Obviously, mm -hmm. you have every reason to suspect something is amiss. What do we do? Report to the police. And trust me, one of the biggest challenges we have is our social media habits. In the past, before a criminal comes after you or before a criminal uh, kidnaps you, what they do is they generate a profile of you. And it can happen when they subject you to surveillance over a long period of time but now with a click of a button you have every information yeah. about the person and it's particularly scary when we put pictures of our kids the school uniforms their names what time we drop them at school what time we pick them up from school and all that it is very dangerous because with that information kidnappers can use against them sometimes when you are out of the country and there's nobody living at home, it is not necessary letting everybody know that for a fact. Recently, I know someone, this, this is not Toli, okay? I know someone who traveled and thieves broke into his house, virtually relocated to the house <laughs> because they know he's not there. You get me? By the time he came, then they vacated and that nothing hurt him like when they consumed all the yam he had from the north in the house. You get me? So that is how sophisticated crime has become. You, you get me? So because so we, we give them be... our footprints. Yes. And yeah. you see someone put up a multi-million dollar edifice, but for the person to spend 2,000 cities on security, security, it's a problem. I have a security firm. We sell it. And it's very difficult convincing people to track their yeah, vehicles, to yeah. you know, uh, 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 install CCTVs system. in their homes. Because that maybe we see happening. it as bourgeoisie. 
that is a problem. But if you are able to use one million dollar to construct a house, you can equally can, use yeah. two thousand cities to enhance your security because we feel that there is no way we can Perhaps be victims. Can we help the police, even in the in the current state, as partners? Yes, we can. Um, there are so many things we can do to help the police. Most of the uh, operations the police conduct is intelligence led, and they get most of the intelligence from you and I. So if you have any information that you think can help the police execute their mandate as enshrined in the Police Service Act 350, why hesitate giving it can uh, to the police? Can they help themselves? The, yes, the police can help themselves, especially the top hierarchy. Mm -hmm. By showing commitment to dealing with the litany of issues faced by the police, one, the training, the logistics, and of course, engaging the communities in which they operate. Okay. But would you say that perhaps the police service has been infiltrated by some unscrupulous persons too, and this is making it very difficult for them to keep up with their mandate? Well, the police service, just like any human institution, mm -hmm. of course, would have some persons going rogue and doing things that is inconsistent with their values. Okay? But the numbers are increasing. Uh, it, it is worrying. I must say, it comes and to monitoring and evaluation. that's the point. No, because you, you wonder point. how they are unable to screen these people when they go through the training system. And because we reduce some of these things to protocol list and you know party foot soldierism and all that, that is why we sometimes have some of these elements uh, easily compromised. But I, I think, like you rightly mentioned, yeah. it boils down to the monitoring aspect of it. I mean, when we issue the the, the firearms yes. to the police, are we able to keep a robust database of Mr. A is in possession of this firearm, AK-47, with this serial number? Do we have that database or we still have to write it on the paper? So if I take some uh, uh, firearms and I want the, uh, what do we call it, the records to go, I just go and, you know, t tear the paper off the whole book. No. We, I think we have to digitalize crime and investigation if really we want the okay. security Are we getting to, to a improve. point where citizens need to register and sign up for firearms? Because <sighs> the there's some confidence waning in the uh, security. You are absolutely right. Because when you take a closer look at the records, actually people illegally acquiring firearms is on the ascendancy. And according to my alma mater, the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, there's well over two million illegal guns in the hands of private people in the country. And that is worrying because you would see a lot of Ghanaians in, the, in a quest to protect themselves, taking the laws into their own hands by engaging even in mob injustice. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But there are some laid down rules for civilians Fire, um, to acquisition. acquisition. Indeed, and they train yes. you, the yes. police trains you uh, as well. That is if you uh, decide to go for it. But we have an Arms and Ammunition Act 526. That clearly states how someone can acquire a firearm. First of all, you would have to go for a permit. Yes. That lasts for only six months. That would give you the right to purchase the gun from a registered arms dealer recognized by the police but after acquiring that arm it doesn't end there you would have to go back to the police for it to be licensed which can last for one year but immediately that one year elapses from the second day or the first day going it becomes an illegal arm but, but the problem what about is if it goes into another person's hand yes you have, to, not you have to who is not also a, a recognized a person to handle that particular gun is it not also i think you'll be held liable you'll be held liable no, because i'm asking about the illegal because, because you, you 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 have a situation where for instance you pick uh, info that this person from kaswa has a registered gun who Transfer. used it was not good <laughs> registered so or if you are reckless if you are reckless mm -hmm. and someone steals your gun you are, you are liable or mm -hmm. if you change ownership the illegal way, you are liable because the serial number, everything is in your name. Even when you check the Arms and Ammunition Act, I think Section 10 states that the IGP is supposed to have a central register of all those weapons. So yeah. all those names is on the database. I okay. think these acts that you mentioned, the your center or the police need to advise more and there's disseminate this information so that these, this number of two million arms that are out there illegally Perhaps people who have every right to acquire the arm should come forward so that you can reduce the number of 
unlicensed ammunition Well, in the past, there was an amnesty provided by the police for people to bring in even illegal weapons for it to be mainstreamed. Uh, unfortunately, it has failed to work. So the question is, the database we have, people's names, their phone numbers, their addresses next of kin, why don't we make a deliberate, conscious attempt to go after these people? Because we know their addresses. Yes. Because yes. it is it is enshrined in the law. So the that IGP is the Ministry is of Interior, to... that is the Ministry of mm. Police mandate. Exactly, the, 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 the police, police service. service. Unfortunately, we have issues with regulation in the country. But finally, I think going beyond the illegal acquisition is something, there's something more we need to look at. The local gun manufacturing industry in Ghana. Oh, okay. It is... It is For hunting. The, uh, no, <laughs> it goes beyond hunting. And the mechanism is simple, okay? Even apprentices, welder apprentices, blacksmiths are able to do it, especially in the hinterlands, yes. and especially at conflict hotspots like yeah. Nkonya and Alabanyo and Yendi and other mm. places. I think we have to really look at it going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Executive Director of Center for Human Security and Peace Building, Adip Sani. Thank you. It was very insightful. Thank you. And so we take a break. We'll be right back. Okay. So Eliza, what are you picking up for this week? We had um, COPEC given us a lot of information on political interference with uh, BOST and that is resulting in the frequent change, the high turnover of CEOs at BOST. Hopefully, Mr. Provencal will be allowed to do his work and um, we, we're watching, we're looking at the, the, the ups and the downs and we hope the president can make a firm decision on issues that arise from their investigations as the CEO uh, position is a political appointment so it's the president who appoints to that position so yes he does have a fair responsibility on making sure that whoever his appointee is is allowed the room to operate without interference from the back end <laughs> also with the police it's really unfortunate my sincere condolences to the families five officers down in less than in less than 30 days is tragic the there are other ramifications regarding this um, assassination because pretty much that was uh, that was murder the children that uh, witnessed this last shooting uh, what are the steps to look at their psychological welfare the trauma they would be going through that is a, 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 even a, the, the sound of a knockout is so loud in your hearing and to hear a gunshot and see a man being shot in the head and then lying back lying down dying and fire other shots being fired into a dying police officer is the worst thing that can be imprinted on a child's or any other individuals even an adult's uh, mind so yes, in a, a lot of work needs to be done. The police training are oh, so much. The high points are so many. I am looking forward to a time where the um, appointees would learn to be firm and then steer their establishments in the direction of their mandate. Because it is worrying if BOST is going the other way when it's supposed to be laying foundation for yeah. transportation of fuel to, for us to have a reserve so that mm -hmm. when there's an international emergency or even a local emergency that prevents us from uh, coming in or shipping in oil, then at least we have some, uh, something to rely on for at least three months. If this is not happening, yeah. then of course it means that we are open to all sorts of insecurity in terms of fuel. So um, we should look at it. Uh, appointees should be bold enough to say it as it is. And so. uh, perhaps bridging the gap uh, for the uh, police ratio, please. Uh, so, one so to 900. One to 900. Maybe reduce it to the one to 500 at least. Yes. Uh, personal security, we should do a lot more um, mm -hmm. lessons for ourselves. And yeah. then we shouldn't have a kind of apathy when it comes to... Uh, our attitude towards the police. Well, Maybe the, the police, police should also change. change. Yeah. But you know, I, 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 it's sometimes it's good for you to, if the man is misbehaving, 
show some kind of attitude that would let the person also realize upon sitting back yeah. that uh, you have a good attitude and maybe they would also uh, change. Yeah. Well, it's been a very interesting <laughs> episode of Captured by Women. Our sponsors are um, Emerald Suites and we are located in Cantonment. We also have Woodin Woodin Le Create and also you have RAID, the starter unit of RAID. It's supposed to help you protect yourself from malaria. Enjoy your week. Next week we come your way again with another interesting episode. My name is Matilda Abahins, a communications expert. And I am Elizabeth Olympio Emanuel, a restaurateur and a project management consultant. <laughs>